Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 340, Interview with Chris Berman. Author and lecturer Chris Berman is a graduate of Norwich University with an MA in military history and one of the leading experts on women combat pilots of World War II. He has written and lectured on cultural perceptions of warfare, pre-dreadnought battleships, combat on the Eastern Front, specifically Kursk and Stalingrad, and other related topics. One of his books is A White Star in a Red Sky, and he has written articles on the Night Witches, the female Soviet pilots who brought misery to the invading German soldiers, the main topic of this episode. Mr. Berman, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, you're you're quite welcome. Sure. So let's introduce you to the listeners. Um, what influenced you to become a military historian? Well, I'd already always been interested in uh, military technology, tactics, etc. Mm-hmm. And um, in 2000, uh, 2008, uh, I began uh, writing and publishing military science fiction. Right. Um, and uh, it was around um, um, a little later, my wife said to me, you know, you should really think about getting a master's degree in military history. And I said, oh, wow. um, OK, that's a supportive so I, wife. <laughs> yeah. So I, I got a I got a degree in military history from Norwich University, which is um, uh, the oldest private uh, military school. It it, um, began in uh, 18, I think it was 1826. Um, Did not know that. Cool. And what's interesting about that is they offer their MA in military history as an online course. So you could take it online and then you have to go up and spend like uh, two weeks up at the university. Right. I'll talk to my wife. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, yeah, it's very interesting because you go into the details and the the nuances of uh, you know different military campaigns. You study the differences between the Western way of war, the Eastern way of war, right. um, uh, how uh, warfare actually evolved from um, the ancient Greeks, and the idea of the citizen soldier uh, that started in Greece. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know more than 2000 years ago right. uh, how that evolved into the into uh, an actual professional army that the romans had the roman legions mm-hmm. uh, they were the i guess the world's first professional soldiers so uh, so you've taken all of this that you've learned and you've you've woven it into your stories i'm guessing uh yeah pretty much um you know when i started uh when i started my courses in military history i got a lot of criticism uh, on my writing because they said, well, you put in too much prose, you write like a fiction author. And I said, well, <laughs> I am a fiction author. So right. it, 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 took, it took some work to, to sort of whittle things down to become academic, uh, right. you know, academic work. And at the end, of, uh, the end of the course, the end of your master's course, you, of course, have to come up with a thesis. Mm-hmm. And it's like a PhD thesis. Right. And... Although it's not quite as it's not quite as thick as a PhD thesis, but it, sure. it, it's close. Right. So I'm doing some research on some different topics. I was thinking first about the Battle of Actinon, where uh, uh, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony were defeated by the Romans, and I, it was kind of like an idea, like, well, don't let your girlfriend run the <laughs> army because it's you know it, it doesn't end well. Right. Right. Um, but then I was doing some research from one of the courses on uh, on the gender in the military, and I was looking at the records of uh, the women combat pilots of the USSR in World War II. Oh. And I said, wow, that's really interesting because there's no data uh, from yeah. other standing militaries of large numbers of you know female combatants. Mm-hmm. And then I noticed some something really odd that um, the the records of the women bomber pilots were exceptional. Mm-hmm. They were um, they were really good uh, pilots. They had scored uh, multiple multiple uh, hits on enemy targets. 
And then I noticed that the women fighter pilots, while, you know, some of them were pretty competent pilots, none of them had the uh, um, sort of like the success of their male counterparts. And I was wondering, why is that? There's some type of discrepancy there. So that became the basis of the thesis. And it really worked through the whole process of there's a whole difference in combat between the perceptions between a male brain and a female brain. They actually process information differently. Cool. And that that gave the female uh, pilots advantages on the Eastern Front? It gave them it gave them advantages as bomber pilots because oh. uh, women women can multitask under under high levels of stress better than men can. Men, on the other hand, work better in a three dimensional uh, you know a very free flowing three dimensional uh, environment, which right. would be like the fighter pilot. Oh, dog now, fight. You would, yeah. You would think that bombers would be in a three dimensional. Um, mm-hmm you know, envelope. Right. But they're really not. They're con- constrained to a tight formation and you can't vary that formation. Now you're in a, you're in a bomber, mm-hmm. you're being shot at from the ground. You're going to be attacked by aircraft, fighter aircraft, and you're trying to locate and hit your target. Right. And that's multitasking, uh, under extreme stress. And it turned out that the uh, uh, the regiments that were run by uh, uh, the women pilots, bombardiers, and navigators, etc., um, were exceptionally good at finding their targets and destroying their targets. Right. Um, but there were a couple of very exceptional, a couple of very exceptional um, women fighter pilots. One of them was Lydia Litviak, uh, who had scored. Uh, uh, 12, uh, 12 victories in three shared, and Katya Budanova, who mm-hmm. had 11 victories. Both of them were killed in action. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's why I wanted you to come on to the show because I have four daughters and I'm always looking for positive female role models, you know, strength, courage, you know, determination, that kind of thing. And so when I had read that you read, uh, wrote about that. I wanted to bring you on. And I'm just trying to imagine for a second, you know, it, it's, um, let's just say it's uh, the fall of 1941. The Germans have coming into the Soviet Union. They're taking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of prisoners. Um, Stalin has got to do something. And I thought it was very wise of him not to ignore literally half of his population. You know, as we're going to go into a little later, the Japanese did very little with their uh, with the the women of their country. The Americans and the British had limited roles for what they could do. But Stalin, sure. yeah, but Stalin is like he sees an opportunity here, and he is in a desperate situation. Well, yeah, the Red Air Force had lost. I think it was 41 or 4,200 aircraft within the first two weeks of the invasion. Oh, Most my. of their aircraft were destroyed on the ground. Mm-hmm. And the ones that got into the air, I mean, they had their aircraft at that time was were quite inferior to uh, what the Germans were putting out, which were the ME-109s. Right. Uh, the Russians were flying uh, the MiG-1, MiG-3, and the PO-15, which were vastly inferior to the German aircraft. Mm-hmm. And... Their tactics were terrible, too. They were using World War I tactics, oh. which they, they call it the, the Luffberry Circle. The aircraft would kind of group up and form a defensive circle. Well, that might have worked with 100-mile-an-hour fighter planes in World War I, but they certainly didn't work with 350-mile-an-hour Messerschmitts, and they were just cut to pieces. Right. So they, they had a shortage of aircraft. And more importantly, they had a shortage of pilots. Mm-hmm. So it was in October 1941 that Marina Raskova, who was um, he was she was sort of like a, uh, uh, a Russian Amelia Earhart. She was decorated for her right. um, experimental flights and long distance flights, etc. She went to Stalin and said, look, we have thousands of women pilots mm-hmm. and we should we should utilize them. So Stalin granted her three regiments, the uh, the five eighty sixth, which was a fighter regiment, mm-hmm. uh, the five eighty seventh, which was a bomber regi- regiment, and the five eighty eighth, which is the night bombers, which became known as the night witches. Right. And the women that flew these uh, flew in these uh, uh, 
these aircraft. Mm-hmm. These were girls. These were 17, 18, 19 year old women. Wow. Uh, they had uh, um, they had learned to fly uh, in uh, flying clubs, etc. Right. Uh, Lydia Litviak, who became an exceptional fighter pilot, learned to fly at age 15. <laughs> and it turned out she wanted to fly with uh, in the fighter regiment. They, they told her she didn't have enough hours. Uh, she had only had 50 hours. So right. she went back. She went back and drew a one in front of the 50 on her flight card <laughs> and came back to somebody else. She said, oh, yeah, I have 150 hours of flying time. Right. She wanted to help. She wanted to contribute to the war effort. Yeah, exactly. Wow. 15, well, she can only have so many hours because she's 15, 16 years old. I mean, that's just mathematics. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, so um, I'm glad you brought that up because so not only is um, you know uh, Western Russia being gobbled up by the Germans, uh, Stalin needs every you know everybody can get all hands on deck. They're dealing with these antiquated planes, but I, I remember something that you wrote um, during the purges. I think some of the um, the engineers and and designers of planes were some of them were killed as well. So you're right; they're dealing with very old planes. Stalin, it's not like he's got a ton of planes to give to these women as well. So yeah, they're going to develop three regiments, but they're certainly not going to get the cream of the crop when they start to engage the enemy. Well, they did have um, they did have one fighter plane at that time that was being developed, the Yak One, right, which could go toe to toe with an Me One Hundred Nine. Oh, nice. There weren't a lot of them, right. but um, they they developed them. They, there was a whole series of them, and by the time the war, by the time they were into like uh, I think in 1944, yeah. the Yak three could uh, outmaneuver, outfly, and had a higher top speed than than any of the German fighter aircraft at the time. Here's a question for you: What would you do to save humanity, and how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. I'm, I'm guessing the the Soviets did not get credit for building a superior plane um, because yeah, that, it's kind of the same story with the T-34 tanks. I mean, the, the Germans um, just would not acknowledge how good they were. Uh, and I guess it's just a part of national pride and it doesn't fit the narrative. So it's good to know that the Soviets had something. But again, for right now, like you said, they have to make up the losses of thousands of planes of the first couple of weeks of Barbarossa. Yeah, and then they 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 got a lot of aircraft from the West. Uh, oh, we yeah. supplied the we supplied the Soviets with um, uh, P forties, mm-hmm. but we supplied them with forty eight hundred P thirty nine Air Cobras. Oh wow! Okay, and they, the 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 Russians loved the Air Cobra. It was the perfect aircraft for the uh, the battlefront that they engaged in, where most of the air battles took place below um, 15,000 feet. Right. Uh, the Cobra was not well liked by uh, U.S. or British flyers because it, it did not have a second uh, stage supercharger. Mm-hmm. So once the plane hit 18,000 feet or so, um, it was 
it was easy meat for for particularly for Japanese zeros. Yeah, so just another element of the technology that is necessary for warfare, like you were mentioning uh, earlier, the evolution of warfare and the equipment and weapons from two thousand years ago. But going back to the um, Soviet female pilots, uh, their three regiments. Um, I'm 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 hoping that you have some really great stories because I've read a little bit about the Night Witches, but anything that you wanted to share with us about any of those three regiments would be great because I really want people to get a sense of what the Germans, for all their early victories and for all the amazing success that they had and and, and cutting off and surrounding and annihilating armies, when the sun went down, um, whenever the night witches get started, I know that things are going to change. And, and these German soldiers had to go through a lot of psychological um, abuse because these ladies were just tormenting them from the skies. Yeah, that the the <clears throat> the aircraft that they flew was a PO2. It was a it actually looked like a relic from the First World War. It was a, a cloth and wood biplane. Right. It had a top speed of about 95 miles an hour. Wow. But it carried a um a decent decent load of uh, of bombs under the wings. Mm-hmm. And the 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 thing about the plane is they would take off from grass fields that were fairly close to the uh, the battlefront. Right. Uh, they would locate their target, shut their engines off, and glide in over the target. Because, I mean, these were, were slow-flying right. uh, biplanes with big wings that made excellent gliders. So they'd glide in over the, over the tar- targets silently, right. drop their bombs, and then fire up their engines and get out of there. Oh my, the courage, <laughs> the courage involved in, and one, turning off your engine, two, after you drop your bombs uh, and you start up your engines, you know the Germans are going to be shooting at you from the ground with their impressive Yeah, weaponry. absolutely. Oh my God. That's yeah, they had a, uh, the, uh, the 588th, which was the 588th Regiment was elevated to the 46th Guards Regiment, which meant that they became... Um, they were elevated in terms of prestige within the Red Air Force. Right. Um, but the, but uh, of their pilots, uh, they lost one out of every three pilots. Oh, wow. So there were, I mean, so for all their bravery, courage, and dedication, they did suffer high losses because of coming so close to the enemy units. Yeah, and then and then the Germans started putting up uh, ME-110 night fighters oh. to, uh, uh, to try to take them out. Right. Um, uh, one of the pilots uh, being chased by a, a Messerschmitt actually made the plane fly into a building because she brought the plane right down uh, maybe 10 feet over uh, a street in a little town. Mm-hmm. And the ME-110 uh, is trying to chase her down and flies right into a building. And oh, that's the end of him. Right. That's incredible. So literally using what they have. To, to the best of their ability. Because yeah, the slow yeah, the slow ahead. speed and, and maneuverability actually became an advantage when they were being chased by, you know, high powered uh, fighter aircraft. Oh my goodness. Because and I think you said this a couple of minutes ago. I mean this is a wooden frame with canvas, hundred and fifteen uh horsepower, five cylinder engine. I mean it's not it doesn't have a lot to recommend itself, but if you you know anything can be used as a weapon if you figure out how to do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they, it even had advantages where um, planes that were all metal or aluminum wing, etc., if they had gotten hit with some of the uh, anti-aircraft fire, right. uh, it would have taken out the aircraft. In in the case of the uh, PO2, a lot of those shells just passed harmlessly through the canvas wings. Oh, yeah. What does it matter? It's just a hole in the canvas as long as the engine is fine. or right. That's that's incredible. Now, I did. I was staggered by um, the number of miss missions. Um, can you t- tell us? I mean, like you were saying, the uh, the ladies of the five eighty eighth, they didn't fly just a few. I mean, obviously, the Germans, you know, three million Germans and uh, and their allies coming into Russia. These ladies had to fly a lot of missions to try to stem that tide of the of the invasion. Yeah, well, with the Red Air Force, it was different than like the Allied Air Forces, you know, like for the American bombers, they'd run 20 missions and then you'd be rotated out of there. Right. In uh, in the USSR, um, you flew your missions until you were either killed or the war was over. 
Because they, it's, it's a matter of necessity. It's yeah, life or death, I guess. Yeah, some of those women flew 800 missions. I, I cannot comprehend. Did they lose count at some point? I'm sure someone's keeping a record, but how numb would you be after the 700th mission? I mean, you've, and every night, I guess you're assuming, yeah, tonight could be the night that I die. And you go in. Yeah, yeah. and, and sometimes, well, particularly uh, when they had good dark cover, right. um, sometimes they flew 18 sort. One pilot would fly 18 sorties in a night. Her and her navigator. Right. So they would bomb, go back, get more bombs, go back. Go back again, drop more bombs. Exactly. They were just like, you know, it was kind of like a an assembly line of bombing the Germans. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, um, and yeah, please. It had, yeah, it had terrible uh, psychological effect on the German troops because, right. you know, they couldn't relax. They couldn't sleep. You know, every every 20, 30 minutes. You know, these silent aircraft would be coming over their positions and dropping bombs on them. If I could just stop you for a second, I'm just trying to imagine being a German soldier. And it's not like you can listen out for the plane because, like you said, they cut their engines and they've or maybe you hear the planes and then the engine noise fades away. I mean, how devastating would it be to have a bomb dropped near you with practically no warning? I mean, yeah, I imagine their nights were absolutely horrific because of the night witches. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. So if you have any other stories about any of the Soviet pilots, please feel free to share. But I I did want to ask you if you can compare their experiences with the women in the United States or Great Britain. Uh, What did you find as far as differences there? Well, our pilots, our women pilots, we had we started with the uh, uh, Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Service, which were um, uh, young women that would fly with you know, they were obviously capable flyers. Mm -hmm. Um, They would take the aircraft from the factories and fly them to forward bases where, um, you know, pilots would then pick them up and then uh, fly them to uh, combat areas. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had a lot of very competent women pilots. We lost, I, I believe it was 36 of them during the war, but those were to mechanical failure, weather conditions, et cetera. Right. Um, the British also had a similar service uh, where they uh, had women pilots delivering Spitfires and Hurricanes to forward bases. Uh, so, so, and I'm assuming in America and the UK there was probably flying clubs as well. So when the war starts, you've got women who've got it flying experience. But I guess now for for America, it makes sense. It's not like we're being invaded and we're on the edge and we have to have everybody pitch in. So for whatever reason, America, uh, the government decides to keep women as ferry pilots. Uh, mm-hmm. UK, it's a little more intense with the Battle of Britain, but I guess they just for whatever reason decide you can help us, but it will only be so close to the front. Right. It's it. it, it uh, well, they did also use women pilots for uh, spotting U-boats. Oh, that's right. Right. And but I, not actually in combat roles. Gotcha. Okay. And I guess that was just a, a decision of the uh, the powers that be at the time. I did find out because when I heard when I read that, I wanted to um, find out more about what maybe German uh, Germany or Japan did. And and uh, please add on to this if you if you have any information. I do know sure. that in the Empire of Japan, say from 1937 to 1943, uh, the most that Japanese women were willing uh, were able to do were allowed to do was volunteer associations. But once a a woman was married, that was kind of it. She was expected to stay home and and to you know take care of the house or the farm or whatever. But by mm-hmm. 1943, Japanese women were actually working in factories, obviously out of necessity. But again, right. once you're married and you're a certain age, um, you're removed from that. So a very different picture over there. Although at the at the very end, before uh, Japanese, the, before the Japanese surrender, mm-hmm. um, the emperor had commanded everyone, women, uh, children, oh, old men, right. to pick up weapons and to fight to the death uh, for you know the an allied invasion. And that's why at that time we kind of estimated like if we did a seaborne invasion of the Japanese islands, Mm -hmm. we would probably lose about 2 million men. Wow. 
and and which is probably contributed to the um, the idea of dropping the bomb because to lose that many men, because uh, I think total America lost around was it around five hundred thousand troops altogether? Yeah, about about six. Yeah, about uh, uh, yeah. actually a little less than that. Okay. I, I think it was around three hundred eighty thousand. Okay. And you compare that to Soviet losses, which were, sure. you know, 15 to 20 million. Right. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. And, and in Germany, I think what factory work uh, might have been the extent. Uh, but I, I'm certainly not an expert on that. Yeah. Now, as far as I as far as I know, the Germans had limited use of uh, of women pilots, although they did have their. Uh, one of their aeronautical researchers, mm-hmm. uh, Hannah Reich, right. uh, was was instrumental in developing uh, jet aircraft and also the uh, uh, the V one uh, rocket bomb. Right. So so let's let's kind of zoom out for a second. So we've been talking about the uh, the the various female pilots of the countries, but like you were saying a couple of minutes ago, when it comes to the Soviet pilots, besides maybe the phrase "night witches," there's not a lot that's that that's known. That, like you were saying earlier, um, why do you think that is? That this is a very fascinating topic, and yet it's not it maybe as prevalent or as um, known as it should be. Well, it's kind of like you know, not made by us. Um, right. It, it, right. It, it, it's uh, you know a lot of a lot of history uh, talks about D-Day as being you know the crucial battle of the uh, or the tur- turning of the tide against the Germans. Right. It was actually the Battle of Kursk in uh, July of 1943 that broke the back of uh, uh, the German army, mm-hmm. and from that time on. Uh, they kept being pushed back further and further, first through Poland and then all the way back into um, into Germany. Right. You know, but of course they're being squeezed from two sides. It's a, it becomes a two front war, mm-hmm. which um, you know military tacticians say you, you, you should never fight a two front war because yeah. you're you know you're 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 in deep trouble. Yes. I mean, we did in the United States, but we were fortunate to be separated by the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. So right. we never actually had any, um, we never had bombers flying over our industrial complex and, and, and taken out our production capabilities. Yeah, we had the two greatest moats uh, on the planet. <laughs> the two- yeah, exactly. Oh, um, go ahead. But please. you wanted me to mention something interesting about one of the other pilots. Yes, please. Uh, Lydia Litviak. Um, had actually, uh, there was a story that she had shot down in the Battle of Stalingrad. She had shot down a German ace. Right. And he was captured uh, by Soviet forces. Oh, wow. And he, he, he wanted to know, he, you know, because he had over 40 victories. And he, was, he wanted to know who was the man who was good enough to shoot me down. <laughs> I want to meet this. I want to meet this pilot. Shake his hand. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was kind of an inside joke. With the Soviets, yeah, okay, I'll we'll let you meet the pilot. So, um, so this, this this little, you know, nineteen year old girl, uh, she stood about five foot two and weighed about one hundred and ten pounds. She came in, you know, and you know to tell him she she shot you down, and he he just would not believe it until she described the air battle to him, you know, in detail. All his maneuvers and her maneuvers. She's yeah, I shot you down. Ooh, so much for machoism, and that I I would have given anything to have been a fly on the wall uh, at that moment. That's incredible. Oh, if I could real quick, you mentioned D Day, and I did not know this until I was getting ready to talk to you. Um, I didn't realize that Martha Gellhorn, who was an American journalist, novelist, and travel writer, she actually went ashore. Uh, uh, on D-Day. Let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, so it, she wanted to witness the Normandy landings, and she hid in mm-hmm. a hospital ship in the bathroom, and she pretended to be a stretcher bearer to gain access to the beach. So she was the only woman to land at Normandy on D-Day, and I just thought that was incredible. Of course, after that, soon, uh, uh, the following year, she's going to be one of the first to go into the Dachau concentration camp. So at one sure. moment, it's an incredible high for her, and then the next moment, she's seen the absolute worst that humans can do to each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. Jeez. So we, we've kind of talked about the pilots um, from the various countries, but I wanted to switch gears if I could a little bit. Um, 
Earlier, you mentioned some of the uh, cultural perceptions of warfare, and uh, I've got to ask, how does that differ from the various countries that were involved in World War II? Well, this wasn't some. Uh, this wasn't actually. Um, well, it does. It, it does have a tendency. Uh, you do have a tendency to see that in the in the conflict between the United States and our allies and the Japanese. Mm-hmm. Um, the Japanese took on all the accoutrements of a Western military. Right. Um, they built aircraft carriers, uh, aircraft. They built a first-rate um, uh, military machine. Mm-hmm. But their internal philosophy, their war-fighting philosophy, was still mired in, uh, in, in older, uh, different, right. uh, you want to say, different, more Eastern cultural um, perceptions. Mm-hmm. Like the entire idea, we're, we're appalled by the idea of a Japanese, uh, we call them a sneak attack, like at Pearl Harbor. Right. But that's a, that was a particular ambush tactic mm-hmm. was considered, that's a, that's a normal tactic. It's valid. Um, yeah. The, the reason the Japanese even, even went that route is they, they basically were repeating what they did in 1908. The Japanese uh, did a preemptive strike against the Russian fleet in Port Arthur mm-hmm. in the, uh, on the Korean Peninsula and destroyed their ships in uh, while they were at anchor. Right, which drew out the which drew out the entire Russian fleet uh, into the Battle of Tsushima, and they sunk the entire Russian fleet except for two two ships. Right, and they said, well, you know, if it worked. In 1908, it should work now. So we, we attack the ships in Pearl Harbor. We mm-hmm. draw out the uh, uh, the American fleet at Midway, and we destroy it. But it didn't turn out that way. I, I guess that does um, run counter to the, and I'm not saying that it's superior, but to the Western notion of fair fighting, honor, you know, being um, everybody's given a proper warning. Um, because if it's going to come down to war, I guess the Japanese were thinking victory is the most important thing. Don't don't bother me with the niceties. And I and I can semi respect that. In one of my series, I'm I'm covering um, Pappy Boynton from Baba Black Sheep, and when he first goes to Burma with the with the other American fighters, the AVG, um, the British find out what Chenault wants wants to do. He wants them to go up higher than the Japanese, dive down, shoot, go up mm-hmm. again. You know, don't don't engage them because their planes are better than yours so and they've got years of experience so if you just try to do a normal dog fight you will die so Chenault comes up with this idea and when the British some of the British um, flyers hear about this well they they don't like that very much because it's ungentlemanly but again this is a, another example of where where um, defeat equals death and so you do what you have to do and I guess that was the Japanese attitude or point of view well, yeah, I, I I suppose so too. But I mean, when you look at differences in cultural perception of warfare, right? The, one of the biggest uh, the biggest examples of that um, was uh, the defeat of the Spanish Armada in uh, in uh, 1588. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the Spanish had this um, idea of their ships were the they were. You almost want to call them floating castles, right? And the idea was these huge galleons would uh, close in for battle. The ships would grapple, and then the uh, uh, the combatants on the ships would fight each other. You know, with swords and oh, spears and crossbows, right. like it like it was a land battle, right? right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the British at that time developed their ships completely different philosophy. Mm. They were low to the water line, they were fast, uh, and they were lined with with a cannon of all the same caliber. And so when the Spanish come in to close for this sort of like land battle at the sea, right. the British stand off at a distance and just pummel them with cannon fire. Right. And this and the Spanish are appalled. They're they're yelling off their ships. <laughs> what are you doing? You're cowards. You're women. Right. Uh, you should come here and fight us like men. Oh my goodness! And they're just slaughtering them with with uh, chain shot and yeah. uh, 
canister shot and and solid shot and it was just it was a it it was a completely different cultural perception between the two combatant navies yeah that reminds me of something you said a little earlier you know the, you constantly change how you fight you find better ways like the, uh, the the soviet female pilots were using the very thing that you would think would be a weakness in their planes the slow speed to an advantage and and the, and how you fight is constantly changing uh, that reminds me of you know the beginning of uh, World War II. A, a lot of people in the Navy still thought the battleship was the end all be all of how you win, but certainly by the time it's all over with, it's it's the carriers that matter, and the battleships are nothing more than protection uh, for those carriers because they could do so much more damage. Uh, yeah, so so warfare, like everything else, I guess, constantly evolves. Yeah, exactly. Wow. You know, it was like when the uh, when the European knights went up against the Mongols in the 1240s. Uh, right. They ex- they expected the Mongols to fight them the way knights would fight other knights, right. and that's not what they did. They rode in on on uh, these horses. They were little horses. They were uh, lightly armored, mm-hmm. and they just rained arrows down on the uh, the European knights. Right. And when the when the European knights went out to fight them in the field, they surrounded them and killed them all. Wow. Uh, without uh, without any challenge of battle or anything like that. So that you know, yeah. it was a, com- a completely different philosophy of, of warfare. Right. I I don't mean to make too light of it, but yeah, like you were saying a couple of minutes ago, you can't really complain, hey, you're not killing me the proper way. Do it the right way. I mean, victory is victory, whether it's the British ships or the or the arrows, arrow, you know, guys on horseback um, shooting arrows, whatever works at the end of the day is what really matters. Yeah, we did that in the American Revolution. The British came mar- oh, marching right. in in battle squares, wearing these red uniforms, <laughs> right? And uh, and our guys are hiding behind st- stone walls. They're up in trees. They're wearing brown uh, buckskins that camouflage them. Mm-hmm. And you know, as the British approach, uh, there's no forming up of armies facing each other. They right. just start shooting at them. Oh my goodness! Very ungentlemanly. Yeah, well, that's what the British thought. This is this is you're you're not you're not fighting us the proper way. Right, things things change. Oh, um, yeah. So Chris, it's been great having you on the show, and I really do appreciate the insights into the uh, into the Soviet pilots because that was a lot more than I had read. So I appreciate it. But before I let you go, I wanted to kind of circle back to your knowledge of military history and your writing as well. So I imagine right. you take a lot of what you have learned over the years and you incorporate that uh, into your writing to make, even though it's fiction, it makes it that much more enjoyable, knowledgeable, and realistic. Yeah, thank you for for bringing that up. My sure. new book, um, which was just released, uh, is uh, it's titled "A White Star in a Red Sky," mm-hmm. and it's an interesting story. It's about an American WAFs pilot right. uh, who's bringing uh, lend lease P thirty nines to Alaska. Mm-hmm. Uh, she'd found out earlier that her brother, younger brother in North Africa, had been executed by the uh, by the SS wow. when they tried to surrender. Mm-hmm. And she wants more than anything to fly combat. And right. at at the base, the Russians come to pick up the aircraft. Mm-hmm. And one of their pilots is a young woman pilot. She's also their translator. Right. They strike up a friendship together. And um, uh, through a series of events that happens, uh, she winds up taking the ninth plane uh, into Russia oh. with, uh, with the help of her, her friend, and she flies in the Battle of Kursk. So she gets to fulfill her desire for revenge. Yeah, I and like she, she and she's an exceptional she's an exceptional pilot too. And between the two of them, they they, they shoot down a lot of Germans. <laughs> they uh, uh, they both survive being shot down themselves. They go through a, a an extensive. Uh, travel through through uh, the battlefield and right. and come across an unexpected ally that uh, that uh, be- turns out to be very helpful to them a, a deserting german soldier 
Ah, uh, yeah. I wanted to let you know that I was looking through your website and your list of books. So when uh, the holidays comes up and things kind of slow down, I'm looking forward to reading A White Star in a Red Sky and Ace of Aces because I really loved that concept. So those will be two that I'm checking out. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for having me on your, your show. And, Absolutely. And, and as far as White Star in a Red Sky, it's available now on the uh, on Amazon and other venues. I'm glad you said that because that was my next question. Chris Berman, thank you very much for being on and I hope the rest of your day is great. Thank you. Hurry in during Ram Truck Month and discover what it truly means to drive a truck that's built to serve. Ram 3500 with an available legendary Cummins engine. Ram TRX, the most horsepower of any gas pickup ever built. And Ram 1500, ranked number one in driver appeal among large light-duty pickups in 2022. That's three years in a row by J.D. Power. Hurry in during Ram Truck Month. For J.D. Power 2022 U.S. award information, visit jdpower.com awards.